The Ferrari 308 is one of the most well-known and mass-produced cars Ferrari has developed, and it has stuck in the minds of auto enthusiasts throughout the years, becoming more desirable with each passing year. And while the traditional 308 is well known for its beautiful design, it's in no way considered fast by today's standards. The first of the 308 series were carbureted fiberglass bodied cars, and they produced about 250 horsepower. The 308 has always been on the more affordable spectrum of the Ferrari market, and so in the past, when they would get damaged, many times the cars would end up in the scrapyard. However, for a select few lucky cars, a visionary would take a look at a mangled 308, and instead of seeing a pile of scraps, they would imagine a future race car. So the car behind me definitely no longer looks like your traditional 308. And obviously it has been very heavily modified for racing. So this video is gonna be a bit different than a lot of the videos we normally do. Uh, this car behind me is my dad's personal 308 race car that he began building in 1989 and has spent countless hours and dollars uh, turning it into what you see today. So long story short, this car has sat for a while and we just recently got the engines here in bits and are about to start putting the engines back together and getting this track ready. So I really wanted to take this opportunity to do kind of a video series on um, putting this car back together and getting it back on the track. And so this video is gonna start just giving an overview on this car uh, and what makes it so special, but I'm very excited for the future videos too to show you it all coming together. So let's get started and show you just how cool this car really is. So this 308, it started life as a fiberglass 308 and it burnt down in a fire. So my dad took the burnt remains of the car and turned it into what you see today. And the only bits on this car that are original 308 parts is the chassis tubing between the two firewalls, so under the cockpit, uh, the chassis stamping on the steering column, and the chassis stamping in the engine bay. Every single inch of this car, besides those three things, are no longer original Ferrari 308 parts. They have been heavily modified and really tricked out. I mean, just going through all the bits in the engine and the bits on this car, there was no expense spared and a lot of time and thought that went into the build of this car. So for example, Obviously, the body doesn't look like your traditional 308. It's very kind of 288 GTO-esque. Um, and that's not just because the 288s look really awesome. It's also because they're wider bodies so they can fit wider wheels. And basically, when you're racing, it's very important to have wide wheels um, because of contact patches. Basically, you are stuck to the ground by nothing more than that square of rubber touching the ground, or the four squares of rubber touching the ground at any given time. So one of the uh, neat things is this year for SCCA, the SCCA is constantly changing the rules. So it's like trying to catch up with their rules as you're building something like this. So when this car was built before it was parked, the rule was you could have 12 inch rear wheels. And now they have changed that to 13.75 inches. Well, that inch 0.75 on each rear wheel on each side makes a huge difference. So part of the reason for this specific body kit was simply for easier, easier ability to have the wide tires. So the very exciting thing about this car, I mean, in my opinion, basically uh, my dad has had this, he raced this for years and years and years. And recently, if you are a long-term subscriber of ours, you have seen the videos we've done of the Lamborghini Gallardo GT3 car we have that we've been race prepping. And my dad wants to race it next year in the SCCA GTX series. Um, so this car, my dad decided that since I also have my SCCA Nationals license, uh, that I can ra race this one next year in the SCCA GT2 series. So this build is extremely exciting for me for, I mean, obviously, because 
race car that I get to race. <laughs> so I'm very excited about it. Um, and I want to show you guys a lot more about this car, but I figured one of the things we can do is I dragged my dad here this morning so that he can give you a little inside view on what he's done throughout the years on this car. There was a time back in the late 80s when Ferrari had no involvement in GT racing. There were a couple of cars built by Michelotto. They did build two F40 LMs, and Michelotto also built some race cars, but basically uh, there was very little involvement. So I decided to bravely go where nobody else was going and decided to build this car. At the time, I was running uh, Camaro in Trans Am and Insa GTU, and it was great fun. It was a fast car. It did everything right but it wasn't a Ferrari and I was in the Ferrari business. So in 1989, we bought a burnt 308 GTV dry sum car and started to build it into a race car. Like any project, it went totally out of control and totally over budget, and this is the result. Um, I have over half a million dollars into this car, spread over several decades, um, to make what is a very sophisticated race car. It was originally built with a two-valve engine, um, which put out 400 horsepower on the dyno, which is really impressive. Uh, the engine was mounted in line with a Yulin gearbox behind it. It came in at 2,280 pounds, which is exactly what we wanted. And uh, it was actually tested. We took it to, uh, to uh, Road Atlanta, tested it. And we were ready for the IMSA series when IMSA changed the rules and said we could have a four valve. So we thought, okay, we can build a four valve. And that project ended up turning into a year by the time we had it done. So we missed that year. By 1992, the car was done and ready to go, but I had signed up with Jim Downing and was running a Camel Light car and did the entire uh, 1992 season in the Camel Light car. So this sat. My twins were born in 1992, and after the 92 season, I decided to quit racing. In 2006, I decided that my twins were now 15, it was time to go racing again. So we freshened up everything, and I entered it into SECA GT2, uh, did exactly one race, and uh, <laughs> the SECA changed the rules and decided they would allow it to a four valve. So we dug the four valve back out of the box and started work on that. While that was in the process, I developed prostate cancer and when you're cut open like a fish, you can't go racing. So the poor 308 went on the back burner again. Um, I know, <laughs> fast forward another 15 years and here we are. Um, this car can now run SECA GT2. The rules have changed again, but not dramatically and it can also run uh, Trans Am as a GTS car. So we're about to uh, finish the four valve, do the latest updates, wider wheels on the back, a uh, few other, a sequential gearbox is now allowed, and hopefully uh, Colleen will be running this car uh, next year in both SECA GT2 and uh, Trans Am GTS. When we started the project, we assumed that we had a fiberglass 308, so it would be pretty easy. All we had to do was turn the engine in line, put a Yulin gearbox behind it, and uh, widen the body. It didn't work out that way. <laughs> it didn't even begin to work out that way. When you put the engine in line, you find that, well, it doesn't want to fit in the chassis. And there was no place to hang the Yulin gearbox. So essentially, we had to replace most of the rear chassis uh, from the rear firewall back. Additionally, a 308 has relatively short A-arms, and in racing, you want long A-arms so that as it moves through its trajectory, the wheels don't change camber. So we ended up narrowing the rear chassis substantially so that we could widen the rear suspension arms. Then we ended up doing the same thing on the front, narrowing the entire front so that we had a better suspension geometry. Additionally, we had to find eight ways to get air out from underneath the car, hence the louvers here and the scoop in the hood. 
and we had a the whole inner uh, front structure is removable uh, so that if you have an accident you pull off the front subframe with four pins slam on a new subframe with a new with a fresh radiator connect up the water hoses and continue racing and that's partly why we went massively over budget and massively behind schedule the body is now all carbon kevlar and uh, we started with a fiberglass 288 gto body which was very heavy and too narrow so we had to build bucks uh, make molds and then of course make this body so we have the body that's on the car we have a complete spare body hung on the wall ready to go racing so we have most of the bits it's just a function of getting it all glued together in the next 90 days for the next race season you've had an accident this happens when you're racing and you want to change the front end it's very easy it has quick releases right here which you take off you lift it up you push it forward if you've had a serious crash all of this is put together these are all aluminum tubes and you simply pull the pin here pull the pin here undo the various hoses pull off the entire nose slide a new nose on connect all the hoses add fluids and off you go racing the, this thing was designed to run in the emsa series so back then the minimum race was two hours and there were a lot of 12 6 12 and of course daytona 24-hour races where you had time to repair after an accident in trans am or gt2 of course if you have an accident you're done park it for the day so my dad obviously spent a lot of time, like I said, and money on this car. And part of it was, you know, trying to perfect it and trying to build the ultimate race car. But also part of it was constantly chasing the SCCA's rule book. So, for example, one of the things he did is the fiberglass 308s, the early 308 series, was all two valve uh, carbureted cars. So this car originally had a two valve engine in it and souped up, it produced about 400 horsepower, which compared to the 250 horsepower of your original 308 engines is pretty awesome. Uh, however, the rules changed, and at some point, the SCCA was allowing these cars to run a four-valve engine, and those are just much more powerful engines. Those create about 450 horsepower and that extra 50 horsepower really does make a difference especially when you consider the fact that this car is only 20 just actually just under 2300 pounds so uh, having that little extra oomph makes a big difference so when my dad found out that you could have a four valve of course he ditched the two valve and got a four valve and stuffed that in there and had to modify and rework the car to fit the new engine um, so I just wanted to, you know, I'll show you some of the four valve engine. We have the two valve and the four valve here, so I can give you a couple details on those. But as another example of the different rules that the SCCA comes up with, earlier in this video I had mentioned the tires, and now you can run an extra 1.75 inches on each rear wheel. Well, another thing they did is back when my dad ran this, you couldn't have a wing. Uh, you could only have the spoiler, but now they allow you to have a wing. So technically, we could bolt a wing on this car, although with the wider rear wheels, I'm not sure if you need that, because if you have too much downforce in the rear end, then it, it makes the front a little light. So you want that nice balance. I mean, everyone thinks you just add a wing and add more downforce, but there's really a balancing act to it. Too much is not always a good thing. So on a social media post a while back, I had done um, a little visual on the difference between a wing and a spoiler, uh, and it helps a lot when the Lambo is actually here to show, but I just want to give a little overview on the difference because a wing and a spoiler, a lot of people interchange those two words, but they're actually two very different things. So this right here is what's called a ducktail spoiler, and basically they both do the same kind of thing. They both create downforce on the rear end of your car. However, a wing, if you think of an airplane wing, it creates lift. Well, if you turn it upside down, it creates downforce. So a wing is a wing-shaped thing above the car, bolted on, 
that creates downforce, whereas a spoiler, it creates this low pocket of air in the middle. It spoils the air and creates downforce that way. So next time you're wondering, is it a wing or a spoiler? Well, if it's attached to the car like this, where it's a part of the car, it's a spoiler. If it hangs above the car, it's a wing. There is some kind of in-between ones, but those we don't need to get into. Basically, just, you know, for, for a basic overview, those are the two differences. <laughs> Another example of the SCCA rule changes. So when my dad ran this car, you were only allowed a five-speed gearbox, but nowadays you can run a six-speed gearbox. And we just happened to have a sequential six-speed sitting at the other shop. So we figured we'd throw the six-speed sequential in here. Having the extra gear makes a huge difference. Plus a sequential just is a lot easier to use, honestly. Um, so we're going to throw that in the car and we were reading through the rule book and you are allowed to, but you have a weight penalty pu for putting in that gearbox. We did the math. It's about a one and a half percent weight penalty, which comes out to about 31 pounds. So it's not the biggest deal in the world. We have to add 31 pounds extra to the car as a penalty. Um, but to have a sequential six speed gearbox, it definitely makes up for that extra 31 pounds. So those are the kind of like little things that we're going to have to be juggling. And we're going to take you guys along on the journey and film all this as it goes along. So you can kind of see the tweaks we have to make and how we have to conform to the SCCA's rules, but make choices to try and figure out what's best for us racing, what's fastest versus like the penalties that may be charged and stuff like that. So it'll be a fun process. All right, so this is our storage area. And I know I don't show it a lot, but this is where all the 308 parts are currently being stored. So the guys, my husband, who I've actually dragged here today, he doesn't like being on camera, but- And he woke me up. And yeah, I'm out of the coffee. <laughs> it's a bad day. Um, so I got, I got him here and our friend Pat, and between these two, they are going to be putting together the 308 engine and the whole car and getting it all race ready. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw it over to them and they can explain some of the more intricate parts on the car because there's no lack of really cool little bits that make this race car from just a normal car to something really special um and you'll see lots more of these little bits throughout the different episodes as the car gets built but today i wanted to give them a chance to show you some of the really cool parts uh so i'm gonna throw it over to them it's the so-called four valve engine for obvious reasons you got four of them these are titanium Titanium nitride coated, they weigh nothing. Small block Chevy guys will think these are adorable. They look like something like a doll for them. Should have brought a scale. Yeah. But they weigh nothing. Now that reduced mass means they open and close even faster than they normally would. And to take advantage of the increased breathing four valves give you, we got a diabolical piece of equipment called a flat slide valve, which if wide open is a direct shot right to the engine you can actually see the valves running if you've got the engine on the dyno now what that does is increase the air in and air out of wide open throttle which means you pass all the v8s with the throttle and another trick thing that ferrari did on almost every engine they ever made let me break this thing real quick the cam gears have a kind of circular vernier gauge the circle that this sits on is slightly smaller when you take the pin out, you can move it a minute amount and put the pin in on the one that it lines up on, and it gives you an almost infinitely variable cam timing relative to each other and to the crankshaft. Make this engine idle at 2,000, pull all the way to 15,000, make it idle at 800, have vacuum for power brakes. You can do almost anything with the time. You can also tune yourself into destruction. You have to know what you're doing with these things. And I don't, but I pretend to. <laughs> <laughs> We're secretly building a grenade. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, as Pat was explaining, the other intake, basically with a slide valve, it creates nothing blocking the path of the air. So this is a butterfly valve and basically it's closed and when it's fully open, uh, you can see that there's still that chunk of metal in the way of the airflow. So it's little tiny things like that throughout the entire build of the car that make a huge difference. All the little things add up. Uh, and that's how you can take a 250 horsepower 308 and turn it into a 450 horsepower race car. 
So I hope that you guys have enjoyed this little uh, intro video into the 308. There's going to be a lot more. So definitely subscribe to our channel and stay tuned because there's going to be a lot more content coming very soon.